record. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the NASA Alumni League First Thursday virtual program. Uh, it's July 1st, 2021. I'm Stokes McMillan. Uh, today, our speaker will be space historian and author Andy Chaikin. Andy is best known as the author of A Man on the Moon, The Voyages of the Apollo Astronauts, which tells the story of the Apollo missions through the eyes of the astronauts. The book was the main basis for Tom Hanks' 12-part Emmy-winning miniseries for HBO, From the Earth to the Moon. Now, Andy graduated from, in geology from Brown University and began his career as a space journalist and historian in 1980, covering the first flights, uh, first shuttle flights for Sky and Telescope magazine, one of my favorite magazines. As a visiting instructor at NASA, he has taught the history of human and robotic space missions, as well as the human behavior aspects of success and failure in spaceflight projects. So now let me turn it over to Andy Chaikin. All right, well, thank you, Stokes. And I'm really uh, happy to be here. I'm really happy to have a chance to talk to y'all. And um, so, um, you know, as Stokes commented, um, for about uh, 11 years now, uh, I've actually been doing more teaching than writing. Um, I've been a visiting instructor at NASA First, I was teaching a course in space history as part of the Apple program, and I taught that at, at every NASA center. Uh, and more recently, uh, at the request of um, the then Goddard Center Director Chris Scolese and the then uh, Chief Knowledge Officer at Goddard, Ed Rogers, I started looking into human behavior, the human behavior elements of success and failure in space flight projects. And, and um, that course I have been teaching at NASA since 2016. Uh, Lisa Moore, who recently retired uh, from JSC Engineering was the main catalyst in my creating the course. Um, but I've had an awful lot of help from a lot of people, including some of you who are uh, on this call. So I'm, I'm very grateful to everybody that has contributed uh, anecdotes and, and uh, knowledge to help me get uh, you know, really get a good grip on uh, what are the, the, the attitudes, beliefs, and assumptions that we need to have to be successful in something as unforgiving as spaceflight. Now, I'm not really talking about the flight crews. Um, that's a whole interesting subject in itself. Uh, but what I'm really focusing on is the project teams all the way from, uh, you know, the first decision to go ahead with a big project all the way through completion. Um, and so what I've done is I've gone back to Apollo. Um, and of course, we're, celebrating, we're about to celebrate an Apollo anniversary this month with uh, the landing of Apollo 15, 50 years ago on July 30, 30th. Um, and of course, that was a spectacular mission that built on everything that had been done before um, most of the public doesn't even remember that we went back to the moon several times and that, you know, two years after Neil and Buzz were walking around on the Sea of Tranquility, we had Dave Scott and Jim Irwin living on the moon for three full days with a battery powered rover that let them go for miles over the surface and uh, even up the sides of lunar mountains. And so, um, you know, Apollo is an incredible story on so many levels. And I've really been fascinated to go back to Apollo and, and say, okay, you know, what, what were the behaviors, really the mindset, if you want to talk about one word, what, what was the mindset of the people who were doing Apollo that allowed them to do this incredible challenge that really seemed impossible at the time, almost at the time it was created. So what I've done is I've created a framework to talk about this. And, and the first thing we have to understand is that um, most people who do spaceflight 
think, and, and most of the public too, you know, the, they talk about the rocket science. Well, we know it's really rocket engineers, not rocket scientists, but be that as it may, you know, the technical piece, the, the really surprising thing that we get out of the history is that as hard as the technical stuff is, it is not the thing that makes or breaks a project. It's really the human behavior piece that is even harder. So it really deserves our attention and our understanding. So what I've done is I've created a framework to talk about the behaviors that either invite success or, or lead us away from success and invite failure. And we're gonna talk about each one of these in detail. But um, on the left there, you see what I call the Apollo pyramid of success. So this is a set of initial conditions and a set of uh, practices and even individual behaviors that um, come out of the history. Um, and I, I didn't make all of this up myself. I, I drew on the writings and, and oral histories of the people who did Apollo to come up with this framework. Um, and at the same time, we have to talk about the human behaviors that lead us away from success. And I call those failure ingredients. And we'll talk about them too. Um, so let's start with the success elements. And so the very first one, the base of the pyramid is you got to have a clear and compelling goal. And that goal has to come from the top. Well, of course, we had that with Apollo um, as, as fantastic as we could ever hope to have had because um, Kennedy's goal, you know, land humans on the moon before the end of the 60s, return them safely to the earth. Everybody in the organization knew what the goal was. Um, there was no ambiguity whatsoever. Um, and, you know, uh, you could even go outside and look at the moon and, and say, that's, that's where we got to get to by the end of the decade. So, you know, everybody from the administrator down to the lowest guy on the totem pole, the lowest technician, or even the, the people who weren't even doing tech, technical work knew what the goal was. And that, is an amazing thing for an organization. Um, it's not that everything becomes, you know, magically clear on how to do it, but imagine what you would have if you didn't have that kind of clarity. It really um, marshals all of the, uh, as Kennedy said, the abilities and skills of an organization. Um, and unfortunately, most of the time we have not had this. So Apollo is a really great lesson in what we can do when the goal is compelling and clear. Now, number two, it doesn't do us that, you know, that much good to have a nice, clear and compelling goal if we don't have the resources to carry it out. Well, thanks to um, the conditions that surrounded the creation of Apollo during the Cold War, Congress understood or was receptive to Kennedy's pitch because you know everybody understood that we were in a Cold War battle with the Russians and we needed to do something spectacular in space to win that battle. Um, that's where Kennedy's genius came in was that he understood that, that, that it was, space was the new arena of the Cold War. So that was, that was really the reason why Congress was willing to fund Apollo like a war. But the other thing was we had a fa fabulous administrator in Jim Webb, who was not a technical guy, but politically very, very savvy and was able to keep going up to the hill to uh, get the money that NASA needed to do Apollo. Um, so, so the resources were there, not a blank check, but certainly you know, enough to do the job. And then some, as we just talked about with Apollo 15, there was no, you know, part of Kennedy's challenge that would have included, you know, a rover on the moon and three day stay times and, you know, full up scientific expeditions. Okay, number three, superb leaders and the culture they create. So, you know, this sounds like a no brainer, right? Um, but think about what, it meant in the context of Apollo. And if you can see the three guys in that photo, on the left, you have Chris Kraft. 
in the middle, you have Bob Gilruth, the first director of the Manhattan Spacecraft Center now, JSC. And on the right, George Lowe. These are three examples of the superb leaders that NASA had. Okay, they, they understood what it took to do a technical job of the magnitude. I mean, they didn't understand it in detail when it started. In fact, I think, you know, I talked to Chris Kraft once and he said he thought Kennedy was out of his mind because it was such an enormous task. <clears throat> but after they calmed down, you know, they, they realized that they knew they had the, um, the innate understanding of how to attack a, an enormous technical challenge like that. But also, even beyond that, they were so skilled instinctively at motivating people, at inspiring them to be the best they could be. A lot of the <clears throat> Apollo veterans that you talk to will talk about the level of trust in the organization that motivated them to do the best that they possibly could. You know, um, the hands-on competence that they had in that organization. Um, you know, the um, ability to envision what needed to be done. All of these things were part of what it meant to have superb leadership and a success culture that was firmly based in the physics, the reality of the job, the physics of what was possible that, that drove the engineering. They were, they were, you know, absolutely rooted in that. Um, and so Apollo is just a complete uh, shining example of, of that aspect of a program. And of course, there were many, many more superb leaders besides those three people. Um, number four, okay, so, you know, here's where NASA needed help, right? Um, NASA had tremendous technical competence. What they didn't have at the beginning was um, skill in managing a program the size of Apollo. You know, you guys all know the, the number that gets uh, quoted 400,000 people working on Apollo at the height of the program in the mid 60s. That's an enormous program. Um, and to manage that kind of complexity, the, the systems involved, there was really systems of systems whether you're talking about the Apollo spacecraft or you're talking about the Saturn V or even, look, even the, um, the, the launch facility at the Cape, all of the systems that went into the, the launch tower and all of the things that had to happen to successfully launch a Saturn V, um, you know, it was just an enormous challenge just to get on top of all of that complexity. So, George Miller, who took over human spaceflight at headquarters in 1963, came in and saw that the program was really in trouble. It was about to go behind schedule and over budget if they didn't do something. And they brought in uh, veterans of the Air Force ballistic missile programs led by General Sam Phillips. And those Air Force guys brought to Apollo a set of practices called systems management. And it included things like configuration control, right? I mean, I don't know how many of you on the call are systems engineers, but you know, engineers want to keep improving things until they're quote unquote perfect. Um, but you know, you, if you're dealing with a, a complex system like this, you can't just keep making changes without considering the unanticipated effects of those changes on other parts of the system. You've got to get everybody in a room to look at a proposed change and root out the unintended consequences. That's what configuration control is all about. So the systems thinking and systems management practices that Sam Phillips and his colleagues from the Air Force brought to Apollo really rescued the program in, 1960s, in the early 60s beginning in 1963, the end of 63. And it really was a crucial factor in getting to the moon. Um, okay, number five is understand the environment, okay? 
when Kennedy made his challenge, we didn't know what the moon was like. He said, go to the moon. We didn't know, all we had were fuzzy telescopic pictures. So we had to understand what the moon was like so we could design spacecraft and spacesuits and things like that. Well, NASA did some due diligence on that score with a couple of robotic missions, Lunar Orbiter, several probes that orbited the moon and sent back high resolution photos. And that's how we were able to identify the places that were relatively safe to land with relatively few boulders or, or, or craters. And uh, a series of probes called Surveyor that got down to the surface and actually sent back uh, images of um, this very, very fine grained soil that's ubiquitous on the moon and even had a robotic scoop that could dig into the soil and take pictures to that. So those were very, very valuable uh, missions that had to be done for us to do Apollo. Then there's the question of how do you, you know, what about the environment of space flight itself, okay? In order to go to the moon, we were gonna have to rendezvous in space. Nobody ever done that before. Um, we were gonna be keeping astronauts in space for possibly as long as a couple of weeks. Well, nobody had ever done anything like that either. Um, to work on the surface of the moon, you had to be able to create a spacesuit that could protect the astronaut from the vacuum of space, but, but still provide enough mobility to do useful work. Okay, well, all of these things that I just mentioned, plus other key goals, were accomplished with a program that um, the Manned Spacecraft Center created called Gemini. And you see the Gemini uh, rendezvous photo on the right there. You know, they did space rendezvous, they did space walks, they did long duration flight up to two weeks. They even did controlled reentries like we would have to do coming back from the moon. So, you know, this was another key uh, plank in our success pyramid. Number six, outside the box ideas can win. You all know the story. Um, you know, NASA originally wanted to send a very, very large vehicle down to the surface of the moon, um, but it really proved to be untenable. Um, for one thing, it would have taken two Saturn Vs for every landing mission. And, you know, aside from that, there were questions of how you'd even land something that big. Plus, it would have required rendezvousing in Earth orbit and refueling before you head out to the moon. Well, all kinds of problems associated with that. Well, a fellow at NASA Langley and John Hobalt uh, championed an idea for a separate spacecraft that would have just the job of landing on the moon and then going back into lunar orbit to rendezvous with a mothership. And the mothership would carry the astronauts to and from the moon. Well, there was a lot of resistance to that idea, particularly at Marshall, where they were very invested in Earth orbit rendezvous. And of course, would have given them twice as many Saturn Vs to build. But in the end, you know, Hobalt was able to make his case despite some, and, and I'm not just Marshall, I mean, Max Faget <laughs> said to Hobalt, your idea, you know, your, your figures lie. <laughs> and uh, really pushed back very strongly. But Hobalt, you know, actually contacted the deputy administrator, the associate administrator, Bob Siemens, who enabled him to get a fair hearing and lo and behold, Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, which was the name of this scheme, was adopted. And, you know, um, as George Lowe later said, we wouldn't have gotten to the moon without it. So you have to have a, a climate, you have to have a culture in which outside the box ideas can get a fair hearing. It doesn't mean every outside the box idea is the one you want to do. A lot of them are just crazy ideas, but they have to get a fair hearing. And if they're the best idea, they have to be able to win. Okay, number seven is risk reduction by design. So this is a fundamental element of the engineering philosophy of Apollo. You're taking an enormous amount of risk sending humans to the moon. You wanna start reducing that risk in the design of your, of your vehicles. And one example of that, the three little artworks that you see there are the three engines on the Apollo spacecraft. And you know, one, the, the one on the left gets you into and out of lunar orbit. Then there's the one in the middle that gets you down to the surface of the moon with the lunar module. 
And then on the right, the one that gets you off the moon with the ascent stage of the lab. All three of those engines were designed in a way that reduced risk because they used hypergolic propellants that ignite on contact. They didn't need an ignition system, right? So that's reducing complexity, it's reducing possible failure modes. Um, they were pressure fed, so they didn't need fuel pumps. Um, everything in the engine was redundant except the um, ignition chamber and the thrust, the thrust uh, nozzle. Um, so, you know, they really used risk reduction by design as the key element, not just with these engines, but with so many other aspects of Apollo. Um, now, even with all that risk reduction, you can still have failures. So you, what you want to do is you want to test the heck out of everything before you go. And, and so I, I talk here about exhaustive and realistic testing, and both adjectives are crucial. It doesn't do you much good to test the heck out of things if you're not testing it in the same conditions that it will see in flight, right? So on the image there, you see the giant engines of the Saturn V first stage being tested at Marshall, um, you know, they had a lot of problems with those engines and testing is the thing that showed that those problems had been ironed out. And of course, the Apollo spacecraft, they put it into the vacuum chamber at, at Manned Spacecraft Center. Um, they did testing down to the component level, the subsystems level, of course, the systems level and the entire spacecraft level. And this was a time when we were just beginning to learn about things like infant mortality in electronic components. And so the whole aerospace industry was coming to grips with how do you test hardware that has to work the first time. You don't get, it's not, you know, an airplane, you can taxi on the runway and see if it's okay before you decide to take off. You can do a couple of circles around the field before you take it on a long flight. You can't do any of that with a space vehicle. It's gotta work the first time. So testing becomes a proxy, a substitute for flight experience. And George Lowe said that one of the key reasons for Apollo's success was the enormous testing program, the breadth and depth of the testing program. Now, here's where our success elements kind of dovetail because testing costs money. And the only reason they could do all of that great testing was because they were funded to the level that they were. Today, of course, we aren't so fortunate and program managers really have a tough job figuring out, you know, out of 10 tests, they can only afford to do five. So which five do you cut out and which five do you keep? I'm not saying that anything, that this stuff is easy. I'm not saying we can go back to 1961 and have what Apollo had, but we need to understand what Apollo had so that when, when we have things that are cut back from that, like today, we're, we're going in with our eyes open. Um, number nine is what if thinking, this is like the hallmark of NASA, right? I mean, you gotta sit down ahead of time and look at every phase of the mission and say, what do we do if we lose comm? What do we do if we lose the fuel cell? What do we do if we're off, off our trajectory? They did all of that. They wrote these, you know, long books of mission rules. And then they ironed all that out in the simulator, which was a test, not only of the astronauts, but the flight control teams. And, you know, what if thinking saved Apollo 11, right? The computer alarms that came up in the simulation a couple of weeks before the flight and led to Jack Garman in the back room of mission control having his little crib sheet when those alarms came up during the Apollo 11 land and saved Apollo 13 because things like the, um, the engine burn that got them back on the free return using the lunar module descent engine, that was something that had been thought up in 1964 and had been tried on Apollo 9. Um, I'm gonna speed along here because I'm conscious of the time here. So Bud, here's your, here's your uh, shout out, Bud Kastner. Uh, made me aware of uh, all the ways that Apollo propellant tanks failed 
And uh, he had a great quote, there's no such thing as a small change. Sometimes just something as simple as the composition of the weld wire uh, led to a tank rupturing during pressure testing. So you gotta pay painstaking attention to detail. Um, number 11, visibility and accountability. All right, you gotta, you gotta be, if you're in the, in the management chair, you gotta be able to look down and see into your organization and see what people are struggling with. And different people had different ways of, of doing that, but that's really critical. And then you've also got to instill a culture of accountability where if those people lower down see a problem, even if it's outside their area, they will flag it and if possible, find a solution before it becomes uh, an unsolved problem. They elevate it to the level that they can get the resources to solve it. And you know, the little graphic there is one of the motivational posters that NASA used. You know, Apollo will be judged by results, not intentions, and the Snoopy astronaut. That was all designed to, to motivate people in this uh, accountability. Number 12, learn from mistakes and remember the lessons. You know, mistakes are gonna happen. And as much as I love Gene Kranz, um, I think people uh, tend to misuse sometimes the quote, his, his quote, which he never actually said because he didn't have to say it. Failure is not an option, right? That's true when human lives are at stake. Failure is not an option for sure. But when you're in development, you know, you've got to be able to fail if you want to get to success. And sometimes you fail even when, you know, you're in a flight. When you're, you know, we, we, we've seen that. We're going to talk about that in a second with Apollo and with Show. But the thing is, you know, so many people talk about failure as the best teacher. And you, you, failure causes us to change our awareness. We suddenly see things differently. We say, God, how could we have done X, Y, Z? The problem is that over time, we revert back to our previous mode of behavior. So the challenge is to remember the lessons, okay? And, and that's one of the things that I talk about a lot when I give this course. Finally, 13 is luck. Gotta say, there are times when luck makes the difference between success and failure. The picture is John Aaron, who was an ecom uh, on Apollo, and it was just a lucky break for NASA that he was the ecom on Apollo 12 when Apollo 12 got hit by lightning during its ascent um, in November of 1969, because John had, had seen it knocked off the electrical system, knocked it offline, and he was looking at garbage instead of data. Well, he remembered from a a, a, a practice countdown a year before where he'd had garbage instead of data due, a, due to a low voltage condition by accident at the Cape. And he found out about a little box in the spacecraft called the signal conditioning electronics, SCE, which if you set it to auxiliary, it could handle the low voltage and you'd get your data back. And so that's what he told the flight director that the crew should do. And they did it he got his data back and they avoided an abort. Okay, so I just mentioned that, you know, failures do happen, but we have to learn from it. So what are the lessons of the three human spaceflight failures that NASA has experienced? Well, the Apollo fire um, shows us that even in a near perfect program, all these things going for it, the resources, the superb leadership, all of the uh, support that we had, um, the technical competence, all of these things, we can still fail. And it's really the human behavior piece that's at stake here. Because we'll talk about this a little in a second. You know, the fire, you could talk about the technical causes of that fire, right? Pure oxygen at higher pressure during a sealed uh, in a sealed spacecraft during a practice countdown, uh, combined with um, vulnerable electrical wiring that created a spark, combined with um, 
flammable materials, materials that were highly flammable in pure oxygen and high pressure and created the fire. But that is not enough. You have to look at the human behaviors. And one of them was that NASA kept saying, you know, we've done pure oxygen on every human space flight we've ever had, and we've never had a problem with it. So we're not gonna have a problem with Apollo, okay? We'll talk more about that in a second. Okay, Challenger, um, you know, really both shuttle accidents uh, teach us a lesson that we have to learn, which is that we have to pay attention to the stories we tell ourselves about the work and about ourselves. So in NASA, in, in the case of the shuttle, you know, NASA had talked itself into believing that the shuttle was going to be routine, it was going to make spaceflight routine and affordable. So they were pushing a launch rate that was untenable. And, you know, if you go back and you read the congressional testimony uh, after the accident and, and the Rogers Commission report, you know, you see people like astronaut uh, Hank Hartsfield, who said, man, if we hadn't had the Challenger accident, we were going to hit an absolute wall with crew training in 1986. We were going to be brought down one way or another because the flight rate was just unrealistic. And, uh, you know, Gary Johnson and I have talked at great length about another flight that if, if Challenger hadn't killed a crew, would very likely have, which is the Shuttle Centaur. And unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to talk about that today, but I'm gonna be writing up a paper about that. And it will be in my book as well, the, the book that I'm writing now, that's the companion book to this course. So we really, we are storytelling beings. That's how we make sense of the world, the stories we tell ourselves. So we really have, Challenger teaches us, we really have to pay attention to those stories. Now, Columbia teaches us that awareness has a shelf life, right? We learned painful lessons. NASA learned painful lessons from Challenger, but they forgot them by the time of Columbia. So that is a really critical, critical lesson. You know, the, the human behavior elements of Challenger Columbia, it's almost like watching the same movie with different actors. And to some extent, the Apollo fire is that way too. So I hope all of this is hammering home the fact that, you know, it doesn't matter how smart you are, how smart any of us are, we can still be tripped up by our own human behavior. And let me briefly run through the failure ingredients. And in order to do that, I, I need to point out the unforgiving nature of, of space flight. I compare it to a high wire walker. But, it, but really it's a high wire walker who's blindfolded, right? It's so unforgiving. You can't afford any slip up or your, your history, your toast. But the blindfolds are aspects of our human nature that are hardwired into us. Let me talk about those for a second. So there's a kind of overarching phenomenon that I call the reality distortion field which is created by external pressures, right? Cost pressure, schedule pressure, political pressure. We're always facing those. What that does, and, and, and this, this is not me talking, this is the history, comes right out of the history. It, it clouds our perception to where we literally cannot see how close we are to the edge of the cliff. And so it's like our buddy Homer Simpson here looking at the funhouse mirror instead of seeing the reality, we're seeing what we want to see, okay? Number two is negative tribal behavior. We all come out of tribes, right? Families are tribes, ethnic groups are tribes, you know, college football teams are tribes. Well, NASA was created from several tribes as you see here. And tribes are great and positive tribal behavior is great, you know, team spirit right? These are things that help us. Negative tribal behaviors are things that hurt us. And it's the, what I call us versus them behaviors. It's things like non invented here syndrome, which I know all of you have either experienced or at least heard about, because it's, it's just a, something that happens at technical organizations. You know, non-communications uh, stovepipes are 
another example of this, uh, non-collaboration. So we have to be on guard to, to uh, mitigate and prevent, if possible, these negative tribal behaviors because they really do hurt us. Um, closed mindset, that's the one where the little voice in your head says, nothing you can say will change my mind. We live in a culture today where most people have that voice in their head. They, they seek out um, information that confirms what they already think. But what the history shows us is that to be successful in an endeavor as unforgiving as space flight, you must be open to real world information that conflicts with what you already believe, okay? So here's an example of, of that. And, and it, it falls under a category called false perception of risk. All right, so we just talked about how NASA had a little voice that, that everybody was saying to themselves, you know, we've been using pure oxygen in Mercury and in Gemini, including high pressure pure oxygen on the pad during every practice countdown, and we've never had a problem. So, you know, the way I sum this up is the little voice in your head says, it hasn't bitten us yet, so we must be okay. Well, that's, you know, okay, but Apollo, the command module, had a volume six times greater than the Mercury capsule. So that's six times more oxygen and six times the commensurate increase in the amount of flammable materials in the cabin. So it was a much greater fire risk. Plus, unlike Mercury and Gemini, the Apollo capsule was big enough for people to move around in during development and testing and check out. And that's what led to the damaged wiring. You know, so all these factors made Apollo a different game than Mercury and Gemini. So, you know, we have to be aware of, of what the little voice in our head says. Okay, false perception of risk in Challenger. Remember this from when we were in grade school and they would give us optical illusions, right? You look at this one way and you see two faces of profiles looking at each other. But if you look at it another way, you see a vase in the middle. Well, this is a great analogy for what was going on the night before the Challenger launch. The Thiokol engineers were presenting data. Maybe it wasn't as well presented as it could have been. In fact, it definitely wasn't. But it was data that was very concerning because it talked about the effects of cold temperatures on the boosters. But the Marshall guys were looking at it and saying, we don't see a problem here. They're looking at the same data, but they're seeing it completely differently. And again, I wish we had more time to go into this in detail, but I hope I'm giving you a little bit of an insight into what, what I'm getting at. Um, another failure ingredient is groupthink. We, we all know what groupthink is. It's where you know, you're sitting in a meeting and, and something doesn't seem right, but you really don't feel comfortable raising your hand. Maybe you're intimidated and you, your little voice in your head says they all agree, so they must know what they're doing and you don't speak up. So we have to keep in mind one key element of success is creating a culture in which people can present dissenting views without fear of retribution. And that unfortunately is not true in many organizations. Number six is cookbook thinking, right? The little voice in your head that says, if I just follow the requirements, I'll be good. Well, here, there's a quote from uh, one of my heroes, Gentry Lee, systems engineer at JPL, who said, there has never been a project in history for which any set of requirements has covered the actual meaning of what needs to be done. Finally, hubris, overconfidence. You know, people who work at NASA are very smart. And there's a danger there because you can think that you're so smart that you can handle anything that they throw at you, right? And Joe Shea, who was the program manager for the Apollo spacecraft in the years leading up to the fire, said in an oral history a couple of decades after the fire, he said, at the risk of sounding cocky, I was the main technical guy in that program. There was no part of that program that if there was a problem, I couldn't get in and understand it. And Joe Shea was definitely a really smart guy who understood a lot and did a lot of great things for Apollo. 
But when it came to the flammability issue, as I talk about in my course and I will in my book, he really did not comprehend the risk that everybody was taking with high pressure pure oxygen. So to sum up, um, you know, on the spaceflight high wire, how do you stay on a high wire? You keep your balance, right? So in this case, we're talking about a balance between ego and humility, the balance between self-confidence and self-doubt. Okay, we're talking about balancing your beliefs with an openness to real world information that may conflict with your beliefs, okay? We have to balance a desire for team spirit, which is a good thing, that's a positive tribal behavior with an, a, a vigilance to avoid negative tribal behaviors like us versus them that rob us of the mind, the brain power that we have all around us that can help us solve problems. And finally, we have to balance the desire for consensus, which is a natural thing for somebody to want uh, in a management situation with an openness to dissent, okay? Because no one pe person or even collection of people is smart enough to, to anticipate all the complexities of the problem. You've gotta be able to voice dissenting views because those dissenting views may give you awareness of something that would have really taken you down. Um, so um, now recovery from a disaster also is a matter of human behavior. So after the fire, George Lowe took over as program manager, strengthened success behaviors like configuration control, things like that, painstaking attention to detail, and reduce failure behaviors. Um, George Lowe was um, very good about balancing self-confidence and self-doubt. And when I think of George Lowe, I think of the fact that he used to wake up in the middle of the night wondering what he'd miss, missed. And, I, and I, I really feel like, you know, if you're not doing that, then maybe you're not doing the job right. Um, and again, going back to the shuttle example, the stories we tell ourselves and about our work really do matter. And so I always ask people when I teach this course, what are the stories we're telling ourselves today that we need to take a look at? Okay, so that was a rather whirlwind tour. Um, and now I'm happy to answer any questions if people aren't totally stunned into silence. Uh, Andy, this is Gary Johnson. I have one uh, question. It's a, something you could add. That is, if you do have a failure, there's a tendency of people to hide it, okay? Or suppress the information of it because it's a bad reflection if you've had a failure. One example related to the Apollo 1 fire was almost a year prior to that, we had a fire of the qualification unit on the environmental control system out at uh, Torrance facility in California. There was no press about that or anything. I got a call back in Houston to go out and investigate the cause of the fire, okay? And me and my section head went out there and we were a part of the getting the information for the official, official NASA board, okay? I did find what the problem was and so forth, but believe it or not, when I re reported what the problem was, and I can talk about that briefly, but I never got to see the official re NASA report that came out. It was actually like classified. In other words, I was actually a contributor for the main cause of that particular fire Yet I never saw and never knew if my report actually got implemented into the uh, final report. And it wasn't until I was later on uh, working and being asked about lessons learned from Apollo, I was digging back through my files. To be honest with you, I'd actually forgotten about it. I ran across my whole folder 
about this environmental control system fire. And so I dug it all out and I was writing up about it. Then I started asking around, gee, maybe I can find out if there was actually a report written. I got a hold of Hank Rodder. He got a hold, and we're talking now maybe just 10 years ago. I'm going through all of this. And right. he said, I think it may be in the old ECS files. And sure enough, he actually sent me that final Apollo report on that fire of the ECS system that I'd never seen. Okay. That's to show you how that was all. Well, the cause was that, uh, and matter of fact, some of my information about the, uh, what happened there was actually, I was told not to put in the report, but what I found out was, is when the guy had turned up the power on the steam duct heater, that's when the, the problem occurred when this chamber was at five PSI pure oxygen. Well, uh, I asked the engineer in charge, who was the instrumentation engineer, uh, who, who did the electrical setup for that? And he said the electrical was handed by electrical technician. Electrical technician had done the electrical setup. And I asked him about this steam duct heater because my evidence had shown that had shorted and arced against the steam duct heater. And that would, and the timing was such that that was the cause of the fire. He said, well, the technician had gone to, uh, was charged with uh, implementing that in the test setup. He'd gone down to Sears and bought a heater cable wire that you wrap around your outside wa uh, water line for keep it from freezing during the winter time. Okay, so he used that and wrapped it around the steam duct cutter. And then of course it had been insulated and everything and put in the chamber. Well, when it was being insulated like that, the insulation on that heater wire was designed to be out in the open in a cold environment. And here it was up, up inside this wrapped up. So obviously it was a case where that temperature had gotten high enough that the insulation failed and it shorted out. So one of the big lessons was there was no materials engineering assessment of the compatibility with that five PRSI pure oxygen. And you took some commercial piece of hardware, <coughs> excuse me, and put it in a commercial environment. I mean, in a spacecraft test environment, it was never designed for. And so that information might've been some semblance. I'm not saying that would have solved it, but that might have put a little bit more focus on looking at materials on the ground in the test setup in the spacecraft cabin. Okay. But yeah. that report was totally, like I said, I was a personal contributor and never got a chance to see the report. Right. Right. So, Thank you for sharing that. So something like that could be put in there like that. Now I also talk about later on a problem that occurred on Apollo 11 during re-entry, okay? Where the, the crew had a close call that could have caused the loss, okay? The you mean the, uh, the fact that they almost collided with the service module? Exactly. Yeah, and it just so and, um, happened I was digging through my files because I was responsible for the service module jettison controller. Okay. And right. so I had been directed way back when I'd forgotten about this way until I ran across my file again. Yes. Uh, that I'd been directed that we needed to make a change to the service module jettison controller. Okay. Instead of keeping the minus six jets firing until they depletion, you put in a 25 second timer to turn them off, okay? And to show you how that was suppressed, okay, by NASA, you won't find this information in any Apollo mission, official Apollo mission reports that we had this anomaly, okay? The actual NASA report, official anomaly report, which I find and found in my files, by the way. Uh, the date on that was November, 1970. You're talking the official report on the anomaly was 
published almost over a year after the mission. Okay. Yeah. Now, obviously, the analysis and everything was being done because I was directed by the program office, we need to make that change. And matter of fact, I still had my schematic I had to make to the Apollo uh, configuration control panel that has a red, red lines on my drawing show the changes we're gonna make. Okay, now I just happen to have that in my files. The date on that is October, of, October the 10th of 1969. So that no, that way, that's a date that the program knew we had the problem, what the corrective action was. Now, because it was close to Apollo 11 and 12 launch, program decided uh, not to do anything. By the way, when they were doing the research for the anomaly, we had the same close call on Apollo 8 and Apollo 10 lunar return missions. Oh, just the same thought, thing? Yes except the crew just happened to not see it because the only way this came out was the crew reporting it. Yeah. Now, they, what, and how they caught that was they went back and looked at the trajectory tapes of those missions, okay? Because when the crew, when uh, Buzz Aldrin po pointed this out during the 11 reentry, of course, he thought it was nominal to see this coming rolling by him, you know, across. Uh, it didn't get picked. And of course, the, as far as engineers are concerned, we're never allowed to be a part of the technical crew debriefs. That's always classified. So that's one reason I never knew about it, even though I was responsible for the hardware. Wow. I had no idea that it happened on those previous two missions. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so I, they I, went back and looked at that and found it and documented all that. And, we, and then, and I, by the way, Flight controllers weren't told about this, and the crews didn't know about it because when Nancy Atkins was down here interviewing me yeah, was, about her movie, about her book, Eight Years to the Moon, I said, I got a scoop for you, Nancy. Yeah, no, that, that was great. And anybody who's on the call and wants to wants to read about this, it was in the website Universe Today. Gary, Gary we should talk about this offline. It would be really fun, but I'm kind of thinking there may be other folks and That's I don't right. know how much time we have left as much as I love talking about this. But the, the point being is that's another suppression of a problem. Yes. We fail to carry on the information. Yeah. Thank you so much for pointing that stuff out. Okay. Thank you. Andy, yeah. this is Bob Brand. It's good seeing you and talking to you. I'm going to keep yes, it. Yes, Bob. I'm going to keep it very brief. Uh, Yes, we did have a, a excuse me a problem with the Centaur flying on the uh, uh, vehicle uh, after Challenger, and uh, we recommended to Rick Hauk uh, that uh, he not fly that because it was a pressure stabilized structure. Yeah, uh, failure was controlled as you well know by five computers, and I don't know that I remember much anymore. But if if you need any uh, help, I'd be happy to try to help you. I appreciate That's, that very much. Bob. Sure, are, you done you. With, are you done in here? Okay, I'm through. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Bob. If I'm still in here, yell before you leave. Who we got? Yeah, I think it was a hot mic. Yeah, Andy, well, I'm sound like you're getting some new information. This is great. Well, it is great, and I've been I, I, I really appreciate it. And uh, you know, I've reached out to the alumni league before. In fact, I had a, a conversation with a couple of folks who who knew Joe Shea and uh, helped me with information about that, and and that was great. And I just would say, you know, Stokes has my email. If anybody would like to contact me and offer information, or if you'd like me to tell you anything more about what I'm doing, you know, um, I'm happy for him to share my contact info. So, um, okay. Well, and, and, and so what Gary said brought up one, one thing I was going to comment about, uh, you know, all the programs I've been on, like that have been canceled, such as the X-38, 
you know, we're always asked to write a lessons learned document and you get input from all these engineers on lessons learned. And the next program that comes along, that, that document is never looked at. You know, I've always thought that uh, that's one of the first things a leader should do is go to the lessons learned and present it to his people. Well, you know, I think the best defense we have against these failure behaviors and so on, um, the things that cloud our judgment, the patterns that are kind of hardwired into us that we have to rise above. I think the best way is to talk about them, to make that part of what we talk about, just like we would talk about stress corrosion, right? Or, you know, any other technical issue that would bring us down. Um, let, let's encourage people to make the human behavior piece a regular part of what we talk about. And that, that goes for lessons learned, you know? When you have a, a project, you know, it, it really is your responsibility, it kind of behooves you to go to the lessons learned and look through them and see and encourage your people to do the same thing. And, and I, I kind of feel like this should be stuff that we talk about in engineering schools. I'm not connected to, to any engineering schools at the moment, but I hope in the future to, to be able to do that. But I, what you're saying sounds like just basic human nature. You know, you don't want, you don't want to hear from somebody else about how they did it. You want to do it your way. Even if you're reinventing the wheel and somebody else before you has really valuable experience that can help you avoid the pitfalls. Human nature, to, uh, the, the way they did it before was the old way. We've got a new, a better way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you have any, any thoughts or plans about doing anything like this for Space Station? Well, you know, I haven't had the bandwidth to get too deep into space station. The one thing that stands out is um, I have talked to people like Jerry Ross, who talked about how much resistance there was in end to end testing to really do all the, the fit check stuff. You know, oh, we'll just, we've got the drawings, you know, we're good. We build it to print then, well, you know, how many times have we seen uh, that one bite us where some aspect of the hardware was different from the drawing? And so, you know, I know Jerry was very uh, passionate about making sure that hardware from different countries was actually physically checked with, with each other. And I know that was done to some extent. And I, I, my understanding is that that was pretty, pretty crucial. Um, yeah, but I'm sure a, that, was a, that was a big fight to get that uh, those kind of tests in. Uh, we actually had one that we we really almost lost the station on the Node One flight because of um, lack of or, or lack of planning to do a gross leak test after uh, to, to the do hatches. A what test? Were, gross leakage test for the air for the pressure to be able to hold pressure. The Node One we reactivated the Apollo altitude chamber, we ran qualification test on node one. It passed by better than an order of magnitude less leakage than required. Uh, of course, that was based, the requirements were based on logistics, gas makeup, not seal design capability, uh, but uh, it passed very well. Then went back into the lab, hatches opened, all the work done on it, pass throughs for, for uh, wiring and, and things were all worked with, and then it was sealed back up patches closed, individual tests on, on individual seals, and no plan to do any kind of a gross leak test to make sure everything was right. Uh, checklists and everything. Uh, I had a, a fellow working, my team that was from Russia, had uh, become a US citizen, and uh, he had the experience of, in fact, I think like just about now is the anniversary of the Soyuz uh, 11 crew that had been on the Sally one station yes. and died. And it was due to a, an equalization valve that had leaked. And he was our leak test expert. And he convinced us to look further at uh, this gross leak test. And uh, 
we were able to get the program to do it. We ran a, a little bit of an overpressure in it and the canister that it was being shipped out to the to the pad on to be launched. Lo and behold, there was it was not holding air. And uh, turned out that it it had a checklist that said close air equalization valve on the hatch. Uh, that was done. It was checked off at least. But kind of forgotten there were two ways to open that valve, one on the outside, one on the inside. So you could use the the uh, the node as a emergency airlock, either to get out if you had to, or to get in if you had to in the future. And um, one of those valves was left open. Uh, oh my goodness! And, and we so had a very we had a very tight timeline to be able to activate the power on the node, get the heaters going, get the water lines heated up, and and uh, if they weren't heated, they would freeze, and you could crack and have you know water line failures. Um, that all could have very well happened had we not had this, uh, you know, this diligent Russian engineer who remembered the the, the Soyuz uh, 11 crew, which wow. because of an air equalization valve that the uh, were to be heroes and parades turned into funerals. In that case, it was the, the concussion at undocking yes. that caused the valve to open. Yes, but it was still a concern about holding pressure in, in the volume and whether everything was really right. So you're saying that if you, hadn't, if you hadn't done that check and you'd gone ahead and launched node one as it was. Yeah. And so they, they get it out with the arm and they put it, uh, attach it to the Zarya. That's right. What would, have ha what would have happened then? Well, you wouldn't have been able to go inside and activate the, put the turn the power on and activate it. Because yeah, it wouldn't have had any, wouldn't have yeah, had any you, atmosphere. I mean, yeah, you'd have to figure out where, you know, how the air leaked out before you could repressurize it. You couldn't go in and activate it. Oh. That was, as I remember, the failure concern analysis that was done on it. The, the potential yeah. was that you couldn't turn it on, couldn't go in, turn it on, get the heaters going, and then the water coolant lines could freeze and burst, and you'd have a big mess on your hands anyway. But, and that Yikes. also goes to listening to, you know, diversity and people from other cultures and oh, learning right. from their experience and, and helping them cover your blind spots. Right. That's, that's, thank you for pointing that out. That's really true. Yeah. That's a great anecdote. Thank you. Yeah. Somebody else wanted to add something? Andrew, can you hear me? Yes. Let me uh, say a couple words of what you said back here. D d uh, tell me, tell me who's speaking, please. I'll let you try to figure my voice out. How's that? Yeah, who's the speaker? Oh, Ed. Right. Okay. Oh well, aren't you gonna, aren't you get on, aren't you gonna get on my case about how little I know from having gone to Brown? No, I'm not gonna go through that. No. <laughs> let's, let's talk about a couple of things you said back in your pitch. Okay, Ed. Okay, let's let's go back to you talking about the leaders and mentors and where yes. we came from. You couldn't have said a more valuable point about the whole program than that point. It wasn't only those six or seven you mentioned at the top. For example, at JSC, down in the lower levels, we were hiring every kid that walked in the door. Uh, Mr. Heflin happens to be on, on this pitch here, and he came down out of Oklahoma somewhere, and they said, oh, you have a college degree, and they hired him. They didn't ask what school it was, what his GPA <laughs> was. They hired him. In fact, I bet you Milt doesn't know right now whether they ever checked to see if he actually went to that school. <laughs> so what I'm getting at is when you say we had mentors, we had incredible mentors. We not only had them where I worked, they had them in engineering. People came down from the level of Max Faget and worked their way down through the leaders. They're the ones that created the way we worked and did business on Apollo. I don't care if you came from the secretarial world. You went the way you were taught and you joined up and became part of this rushing plasma to go to the moon and you joined up 
or you got out of the way. And Gary can talk about what he did in safety and I can talk about flight ops. And I see some great engineering guys that I've known forever on your screen and I'll bet you they'll tell you the same thing. The second thing I wanna to say to you is the fire. Now, everybody latches on to the oxygen. The oxygen burnt and killed them, we know that. But I think the thing that got me post-flight, having been there a couple hours before it happened, I had just done shift change that day. The thing that, when I, we got into the thing later on over in Flight Ops, and Kranz brought us all into the auditorium. And if you find that speech of his somewhere, and you yeah. listen to it, he commenced oh. to tell us that we all killed him. And he was right. And we killed him because we were in a hurry and we didn't do our self-diligence or whatever the proper term is. We didn't do this. We let paper in there. We let Velcro in there. We did the things we shouldn't have done because we were in a hurry and we were on success. We had flown Gemini and we were kicking ass. So oxygen was, a, was the factor that burnt them, killed them, but we killed them. And Kranz but was Ed, I want to I want to thank you for bringing that up. And, and anybody who doesn't know that speech, look it up because there's a great YouTube video of Gene recreating it. Well, I want to point out, and I've I've talked to Gene. I talked to Gene a few months ago, and I I told him every time I teach my class, Gene, I talk about how brilliant that speech was because what Gene did was he not only pointed out what you just said, but he addressed a cultural solution, a cultural remedy. He said, you guys are gonna go back to your offices and you're gonna write on your blackboards, tough and competent. And those words are gonna remind you every single day that you can never stop learning and you can never take anything for granted. And that right there is, just such a beautiful way to have responded to that tragedy to say, we need a culture change here and this is how we're gonna do it. Very good, exactly right. I, I, it blows my mind that he had that innate, but he, he credits the people who mentored him. That's right. Who the, the, the fellow that, that, that he worked with when he was very young, who taught him that every flight is a unique event and you have to treat it that way. You can never you can never think of it as routine. So thank you, Ed. Did you have something else you wanted to say? Okay. I I think I think it's I think it's finished, yeah. That was great. No, you wanna chime in? You've got so many war stories. Uh, I don't know if you, if you wanna, if you wanna contribute one or, or what? Maybe not. <laughs> Who was that addressed to, Andy? Mill. Can I say something? Yeah. Hi, this is Estella Gillette. And um, Hi. I, I was there in 1964. I'm 41 years at NASA, I'm retired now. So I must say that in 1964, it wasn't cool to look at the people side of things, even though it was there, okay? Uh, you know, I grew up with all these guys and it just wasn't cool to, to worry about or to vocalize the people part of things. We, we got better as we realized that we really were people doing this job. Okay. Well, what's an example of that, Estella? What, um, what, comes, what, do, you, what, you know, what do you remember? Well, just, just the basics like uh, today, you know, if, you, uh, if, you if your kid is sick, uh, you can take off and not worry about it. Back then, if your kid was sick, that was your problem. I mean, just that's a real basic, okay? There were lots of things, okay? Yeah. That's one thing I'd like to say. The other thing is um, 
I really like your pyramid, both of them. Uh, they're very significant to this business or any other business. You know, Thank and you. Uh, the higher reliability involved in the organization, the more critical it becomes to have some kind of structure that you can follow and people can live within and all that. So I really like that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Hey, uh, Andy? Yes. It's, it's Milt. I apologize. Yes, Milt. For not, I apologize for not uh, getting back to you right away when you asked me a question. But uh, again, my IT skills are, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's just click this and click that. I swear to God, I, I'm sure glad I did this business when I did. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, the only thing I will mention is the Apollo 1 fire. This is a um, uh, Wayne Coons who picked up um, Alan Shepard uh, on recovery. Wayne Coons was my boss who hired me when I showed up here in the recovery operations business. And Wayne was concerned about the egress time in the Kamala Apollo command module with the with the hatches as they were one inside. Hatch, that'd be okay. Uh, everybody knows about that. So one of the things I was involved in with Mac Jones um, early on, uh, probably uh, two months into, three months into my 1966 of, of being of working here, is we ran a test to see how long it would take to to depressurize the the internal cabin down to ambient so so you could remove the inside hatch to get to the outside hatch to get out and um, it was minutes you know there was a bleed valve to do that but it took minutes to be able to do an emergency to be able to eat, remove the inside hatch and then to get out so as a new, so what I learned from that, that I used later on in my career, as I talked about being involved in, in each three of these tra tragedies for, for this one, I made it a point to the new people when they came in uh, that I got to meet and, and uh, visit with uh, new employees. Uh, my coach let me do that for, uh, for a number of the new hirees from time to time. And I would tell them, look, if you don't fully understand what you're doing and you're you're participating in something and you're being quiet and you're doing what you're what what you're told to do because you're learning but if you have any questions you should ask them because i i look at that as a point of where i did not fully understand why we were doing that test and um you know so i learned from that um, unfortunately for each one of these accidents that we've had um each time one of these happens, you always go back and say, well, you know, um, we knew better along the way. Um, so, so thanks for asking. That's all, that's all I've got. And, and my buddy, Ed Fendel, Ed, I love you, man. Hope you're doing well. Thanks, Bill. Okay, any other questions, comments? Well, okay, I guess not. Uh, so Andy, thank you so much. This was a super, super informative program. Yeah, well, thank so. you so much for giving me a chance to talk about it. I've, I've really been wanting to bring you guys in on this and um, I'm working hard on the companion book and uh, it'll be out next year. I'm going to probably self-publish it um, and I'll be sure to let everybody know when that happens. Um, meantime, I'm going to be teaching the course uh, via, uh, you know, not Zoom, but Microsoft Teams uh, next month. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that as well. And hopefully before too long, I'll be able to get back down there. Yeah. Well, look, uh, I'm sure a lot of people would be interested in, in your book and your course. So when you, you know, if you want some good advertisement, let, let us know. Yeah, you've got my email address. Let me know and I'll, uh, I'll make sure that all the, the, the now people know about it. I, I sure will. I definitely want to look at it myself. All right. Well, so, thank, you. A, thank you. Thank you so much. Curi a curiosity: Who's the intended audience for your classes? 
you guys, I mean, you know, non, non retire Well, I do one for retirees for sure, but, um, it's, it's, uh, NASA engineers. Now right. I, I've also taught it at the missile defense agency. That was right. a very interesting experience. Uh, I taught about 700 of their engineers in groups of 30 over the space of a year and a half. And I got to tell you, you know, NASA does not have the market cornered on, uh, on uh, human behavior uh, uh, patterns. Uh, people are people wherever you go. And uh, it was amazing to uh, see some of the same issues that I write about on full display there, um, you know, without, without breaching any, any confidences. Um, I'm, I, I can just tell you that. Uh, and, and so, you know, um, my ultimate goal is to uh, get this material out for aerospace engineers. And then down the line, um, my wife and I, my wife is my collaborator on all this stuff, uh, Vicki Cole. Uh, she and I are going to create a book for the, the general public that takes these principles and applies them to the, the wider scope of human endeavor. So that's uh, like I say, that's down the line. But yeah, do you, do you include uh, students that are, you know, have uh, not graduated or gotten into oh, the career I would the, be, uh, industry yet? I would be I would be very happy for opportunities to give this class to students. So far, that has not come my way. I, I I've done the only thing I did do was I went to MIT several years ago and gave uh, I gave a guest lecture. And I think I'm doing a guest lecture at MIT this fall. Um, but, you know, just something like this, a very condensed. Well, I, the, the, the actual class is a full day class. Okay. Yeah, well, if you, uh, you know, if you were interested in that, I could probably get you some opportunities oh. to uh, do either, you know, a condensed version in a couple hours or maybe. Oh, I'm interested. Somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we can get in touch. Stokes, if you can. Help us do okay, that. well, um, Stokes, um, if you want to hook us up uh, by email, um, David, that, that would be great. Thank you. All right. Okay, Thank you. That. Yeah, I'll, I'll get you and David connected. Uh, so, Andy, uh, we have a question from uh, William Webner. He says, how will people access your course via Teams? Uh, well, you'd have to get in touch with um, um, Aaron... Um, Oh boy, I'm having a senior moment. Uh, the fellow who does the training at, at uh, JSC, let me get his name. Um, and I don't know how that would work. Aaron Blevins at JSC, and his uh, email is aaron.d, like David, dot Blevins, B for boy, L E V for Victor, I N for Nancy, S for Sam. Aaron D. Blevins at nasa.gov. And I, I don't know, usually the classes are full um, and there's a wait list usually. Um, so I don't, I don't know how that would work, but um, I would encourage it because I, any, any, uh, any interest in the, in the class that gets to them and makes them aware of the interest is a good thing. So give it a shot. It's, um, I'll tell you what day it is. It's, um, I think it's August 17 and 18. Let me make sure of that. Uh, yeah, August 17 and 18 from um, eight to eight to noon, Houston time. Is this for, um young engineers or just engineers in general or? Young and old, Estella. Um, I've had, I've had uh, a few senior folks and I've had some real young folks and everybody in between, you know? Um, and it's great to get everybody talking to each other yeah. and sharing, you know, their issues and their anecdotes. And we kind of use it as a way, see, one of the things that's a challenge I think, and I don't really have the answer, 
you know, I'm here as a historian and I present what the history is telling us, but then how do you take the next step? How do you create, for example, how do you create an organization that remembers the lessons of the past <laughs> mistakes? Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't have the answer to that. I think each organization has to work it out for themselves, but I'm, I'm very happy to be part of the brainstorming of maybe how you solve that. And, and so far, like I say, you know, my feeling is we gotta be talking about it. We gotta make it something we talk about just like we talk about any, any other technical issue. Um, well, the, the reason I'm asking is that we work actively with JSC on their mentoring program. And so maybe that's an avenue for us to explore as to how to connect into this. I, that sounds great to me. And again, Stokes, if you want to give Estella my email address, I'd be happy to have that have that conversation. Okay. I appreciate your interest. Sure. Will do. Hey, Andy, this is Phil Engel. I've got a question for you. Hey, Phil, how you been? Good, thank you. Um, have you had the opportunity to present any of this material to any of the new commercial human space flight entities? It, it seems to uh, me that yes. you know, I, I spent the last few years of my career uh, work in that world. And one of the things that, that gave me nightmares at night was that <laughs> corporate culture and you know competitive proprietary data is sort of the antithesis of so many of the pieces of what you talked about here. And I always worried that you can do great engineering, but it is that cultural thing that we've spent 50 years of learning the hard way. And, and they're so invested in that, yeah, you guys are old NASA guys, we don't need that. We, we're new and smart and we know how to do this. I'm just curious if there's any interest or market for your material in that world. Um, you know, I hope there is. Um, so far, I haven't had any opportunities. I, ha I do know some folks at Blue Origin and I know, um, I know Garrett Reisman at SpaceX and I've, I mean, Elon Musk knows who I am um, we're not in touch these days, but, um, you know, I, I think when the book is, is, re is done and um, I'm ready to go out in the world and, and try to, to get those opportunities, I'm going to be knocking on some of those doors um, because, yeah, I, I'm with you, you know, um, we, we've really got to be able to, to have the conversation that says, hey, you know, you're just doing what humans do naturally, but see if you can step back from that and, and not be so um, locked into, you know, the story that you told yourself. Um, I will say, I've, I've heard good things about SpaceX. Um, I have heard, in fact, for many, many years, I've heard Elon say that what they're doing, they're standing on NASA's shoulders. And I know that they've had their their uh, moments of uh, you know painful awakening of realizing they didn't know quite as much as they thought they did, you know the um, the cop V pressure the, the the composite overwrap pressure vessel right. explosion was a was a major example of that, um, and so I I, I I I like to think that maybe things are not quite as um, scary as <laughs> as they could be. Um, but you know, um, the physics rules, and yeah. you can't. You, you know what was it that that um, that uh, Richard Feynman said? You know, Mother Nature will not be fooled, and and everybody's got to everybody's got to face that reality. So, yeah, um, I, I have anecdotes from from overhearing guys at the Cape, uh, SpaceX guys, you know, sitting in a restaurant listening to conversations, which I won't recount here, but. Even in the bigger sense, you know, when the FAA um, was arguing for licensing commercial space flights, I went and attended a couple of their ComStac, you know, their commercial space flight advisory committee uh, meetings. And so many of the players there had this argument that that uh, profit motive would keep them safe because, you know, having an accident would would put them out of business. And, and I don't think they understood that if any one of them has an accident, it will put all of them out of business. And, and they really do need to collaborate and be open to exchange of ideas. And, 
you know, the, the, the siloed proprietary nature right now is not, not working in that direction. That's a really interesting comment that I have not heard before, Phil. That is really, <laughs> that really makes you stop and think. If, if one of them fails, it could be a, a, a death blow to the market. The, the line for tickets will get really short. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, um, I, like I say, I've heard really encouraging things from, from people um, about SpaceX because that's the one that I know the most about. Um, and, you know, I don't, I've always been skeptical about space tourism uh, as, a, as a viable business, but I mean, I think in general, the launch business has really been strengthened by what SpaceX has done. Um, and, you know, I'll just give you one example of something that, that I think shows the benefits of, of this situation. When they started landing Falcon 9 first stages, and, and we all saw that, and, you know, particularly the Falcon Heavy first test flight where you had two Falcon 9 first stages coming down like a ballet. Um, you know, that was impressive all by itself. And, and it has economic implications that are very encouraging. But it also, I, the, way I, the way I looked at it was that the maneuvers that the Falcon 9 first stage has to do to come back into the atmosphere with retro propulsion up at, at the fringes of the atmosphere, that was basically a test program for how you land people on Mars. Mm -hmm. And I can remember when I was being told by guys at JPL who are the experts in Mars landing, we don't know how to land something big enough to put people in on Mars because we don't understand whether you can do a retro propulsion burn in that kind of an environment. Well, my understanding is that that has now, we now have so many data points on that, that that's now viable. And you would never, NASA would never have gotten the approval, right, to do that test program. Clear. You just needed, you needed somebody as well-funded and as, you know, crazy ambitious as Elon to make that happen. And immune to, to congressional oversight. Well, to some degree, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's got, he must have some being in the position he's in, but yeah, right, right. And, and I, I really feel badly for everybody there and at Marshall who has had to be subjected to engineering by, by Congress. Uh, you know, that's not the way to run a space program. And, but unfortunately, that's the political reality that we live with. And I don't have any good answers on, on how to mitigate that either. No. I want yeah. to mention but something about of... SpaceX uh, that's a good sign is last fall, I was asked by the engineers of SpaceX to actually give a presentation. I put out uh, a few years before a report for the Flight Safety Office on the history of crew override. And so yeah. they actually asked me to give a presentation to their engineers and uh, it turns out a lot of the NASA engineers were involved in the commercial program also about that. And I think the reason was they've been hearing from crew members that well, with all this automation, you know, there needs to be a trade with what you do with manual crew override. So that shows you right there that at least with the SpaceX engineers, they're out there willing to listen to their past lessons learned. Yeah, that's a really interesting topic, man. Um, the guy that's about to go up, the billionaire Jared Isaacsman, Isaacson. Uh, you know, my understanding is that he's he's been trained how to intervene in a, in an emergency situation. But it, if if everything goes according to plan, he doesn't even nobody touches any controls, and that's a whole new. Well, I suppose the I guess maybe we're going back to the future with Gagarin. Who didn't have, you know, do you all know that story? If Yuri Gagarin had wanted to touch the controls, he would have had to fish out an envelope with a, a code to open a combination lock 
that would have allowed him to activate the controls. So uh, I get I started to say that's a new era, but maybe it's not. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, well, Andy, thank you so much. This was a great, great, great program. Well, thank you, Stokes, for having me again. And I look forward to hearing from folks. And, uh, and, and like I say, I'll keep you posted on the book next year. Okay, and I'll, I'll be in touch. I'll let you know about some of the other things we have that uh, you may be interested in that, that is accessible. Sounds so, great. Thank you so much. I uh, just want to let you know, uh, I think our program next month is August 5th. Uh, our speaker is going to be uh, NASA Alumni League member Larry Kuznets, you know, our, our resident PhD on, on how to stop a pandemic with a spacesuit technology. That should be a really interesting. Cool. Well, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, okay, David, you can stop the recording now. And uh, we'll.